and welcome to Kate Anjou's book reviews and today we are joined by author Sabrina Borman. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Um, so you've been all right? I have, yes, I've been excellent. Good. Um, so today that we, we are here to discuss your upcoming novel, Ash and Heart. Uh, this is the second book of the Bloodbound series under Quill and Crow Publishing. I always get my mouth. Tongue tied. Tongue tied, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when I try and say like, oh, crow, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but first I want everyone watching and listening to um, know a little bit about you as a person and like, you know, um, a bit about who you are and uh, before we get started into your book. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't, um, sort of. Um, I'm Sabrina Vorman. I'm from the west coast of Canada on Vancouver Island and yeah. I have been writing for probably about 14-15 years now and uh, my books have found their home yeah. which has been awesome. Um, I really like doing outdoorsy things and seeing nature and whatnot. You know you've been here. I've shown you mm -hmm. around. Yeah. Um, and I like to well. uh, best friends kind of <laughs> and I really like to weave in like the nature that's around me into the stories that I tell mm -hmm. um, outside of writing I I'm a big hiker I that's pretty much where my my descriptors end <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'll read a lot of books on my my downtime um and I like I have, movies and things and yeah, and I was going with coffee if that's where I was headed. And coffee, yes. Yeah. Big fan. Somehow I, I don't actually have one. I'm drinking water. I I have water too. I was going to have a coffee, um, but I thought it'd be really distracting if I was just sat here. Like, <laughs> so It would probably also be very distracting, distracting if we had to pause it 13 times for me to pee. That's very true. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Good, job. Good yeah. call. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so as I said, we're we're here to discuss uh, discuss Ashen Heart. Oh my goodness, we're here to discuss Ashen Heart. Um, so without going into too much detail, can you just give us like a brief synopsis of of people who haven't read it yet, um, what to expect? Yeah, yeah. So Ashen Heart is the second book in the Bloodbound series. The first book is Blood Coven. Mm -hmm. um, Blood Coven follows this group of witches in dual timelines. Whereas Ashenheart follows a character who is related to some of the characters in Blood Coven, um, but it's her own story completely. Her name is Terenia Luca, and it is about her journey through life and this place where she started and the goals and aspirations, which I don't know if I can call them goals and aspirations. Um, well, essentially, she's a bit she, of a hot mess, and then she. <laughs> Hmm. And then hmm. she just sort of finds her way. Just hmm. she finds a blood cult, uh, we could say. <laughs> we could say. Um, and her her goal is to um, basically obtain power. She's power hungry. She hmm. she wants what she wants, and she will use every weapon in her arsenal to obtain that. And she doesn't care who stands in her way. She's going to get what she knows she deserves. Yeah. She's um too hot to settle. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And obviously, you know, with this type of book, you know, <clears throat> fairy tale retellings are kind of what this series is about, but I would say to anyone who's maybe, I don't know, because there's been so many fairy tale retellings people might be getting a little bit sort of jaded by it all and just like oh okay but I would argue that these are I mean I've read a fair few and these are unlike any fairy tale retellings that I've ever come across because I feel like the fairy tale in which they're based is just a very loose blueprint like <clears throat> you know I um I've like recommended blood covenant people and it's and I've not really taught I've just said I'll just read this book mm -hmm. and it's only been right near the end have they kind of tr like triggered in their mind like oh oh is this you know because it's really very much its own world it's its own characters its own storylines and multiple plot lines as you say that run through and um you know and and these books they they are a series but they can all they're standalone as well like each novel could be read by itself right 
Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, that's the way I wanted to write them because I prefer standalones to series. Mm -hmm. And this was never intended to be a series. Just the way it worked out is that it did. And it, I think it worked out great. Yeah. Um, but to touch on your fairy tale thing. Yeah, I use like very, very loose pulls from fairy tales like I would say Blood Coven is the closest one to a retelling yeah because it has red it has um the wolf it has grandma it has straying from the path mm -hmm. whereas these other ones um Ashen Heart and the third book which I I won't go into on this one but they're so loose like you if you read the whole thing if you read Ashen Heart start to finish you would you would pick up on clues that it is a evil queen story, but it's not a Snow White story. No. But I pull elements from the tale of Snow White and apply them very gently into the series. But no. it's it's more of a tipping off point than it is the story. And I'm yeah. not trying to follow the story of Snow White. I'm not trying to follow the story of the evil queen. Mm -hmm. There's elements in them that I love and I wanted to play around with them in my own world. I mean, there's no vampires in Snow White, no. but there is now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you don't, I mean, you don't have all of, like, it's a very dark um, story as well. I mean, there's no cutesy dwarves. There's no, you know, like, it's, you know, it's a blood cult. It's vampires. It's like that power drive there's some you know really brutal scenes in there um you know and like again in in blood coven as well like yes i agree in terms of it's probably closer to its original sort of inspiration than ashen heart um but again it's not for kids it's like it's oh god no it, you know it's it, it could probably be bandied around as like young adult but actually i really like there's some really like brutal imagery in there there's gore there's like really mature themes um and this only it, it is expanded upon in ashen heart you know like for the first time we're seeing like a bit of spice um you know yeah. and we've got this uh sort of anti-hero where <clears throat> Where, like red there is an element of like a morally gray kind of thing near the end but she's definitely someone who we relate to and can sympathize with and while we do sympathize with Terenia, she very quickly develops this kind of ruthlessness um that we still find we're rooting for but it's not so clean cut and morally gray characters I mean they're something that you really really um explore and play around with in your books I mean in Ash and Heart I can't think think of a single character that isn't like sinful or you know evil or whatever in some way it's not all who they are but like there's not a single character that isn't tarnished in some way you know um yeah how important is that to you like in and and why is that something that you keep coming back on well first off they're more interesting characters um mm -hmm. for years like I would say all of us were raised on the hero the underdog the the one who makes the choice that is right um and just because you make the choice that's right for like the greater good doesn't mean it's the right choice for you and yeah. selflessness altruism yeah it's great in real life but I don't really want to read about those characters. I, I, it, to a degree, there are characters in my in my series that that do make those decisions that are altruistic, but they're yeah. also they've done bad things, and mm -hmm. that's what makes them a bit more well rounded. And mm -hmm. I would say that the third book has the most morally good <laughs> characters in it. Yeah, um, Blood Coven, morally gray. The third book, we've got, you know, they have a moral compass. Yeah. They're willing to to make hard choices and, and take life, but they are still good people. Yeah. Yeah. Good thing. In like, Ash and Heart. Good thing for the right reasons. Yeah. yeah. Ash and Heart is, is, yeah, is that very kind of like, this is my aim. This is what I need to do. And this is how I'm going to get there. And like, you know, screw everybody else. Um, author Stephanie Kemmler, who wrote... Um, the Blood Mad series, she mm -hmm. described it as morally bankrupt. And I really <laughs> like that because. Oh, that's excellent. Do all my characters have like a push that guides them to what they're doing? Like mm -hmm. Tereni has got a lot of shit, but her backstory doesn't necessarily make her the villain. 
she's choosing to be the villain. She could mm. choose the high road. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, this you is know? like we have this the the I think the closest thing to like a good moral character is <laughs> is a madame of a brothel. Um and you know, but she says like, you know, she came from these, you know, she sees a lot of herself in Serenia and she came from these awful times. And what she's done is she's bed herself, she's create she's carved out this life for herself that she's wanted where she helps others and you know and she says, like, that's my vengeance. It's not going back and whatever. And, you know, Terenia, as we see, she, as much as she learns from Madame Scarlet, there's a different route that she takes. And it's, it's, that, it's that thing, again, it plays with its readers about, like, is while it's understandable, is that the right way? Is that... Could she have done anything else? Would it, would it have been true to who she is as a person and how she's been pushed and pushed and pushed to make these decisions? And I think it's a really interesting exploration of morality, choice and decision making, you know. So, um, yeah, absolutely fair play. And like, it, and, and how important is that to you as like an author of like having that blurred line between sort of good and evil, you know, like how important is that? Well, I think it's so important. You touched on it staying true to Terenia's character to make the calls that she does. She could yeah. be like Madame Scarlet, but mm -hmm. those choices, she sees those choices maybe don't benefit people. And when she makes the choices to be more morally bankrupt, she progresses. And so we, as a species, as 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 humans, when we get validation we continue to you know it, it builds a habit it builds a how our brains work yeah her making the the good decisions and and the choices that are maybe better for her they don't they don't get her where she needs to go mm. and so you know as an author following my character's story I don't write a story I write a character who tells me their story and so yeah where she starts and where she ended up that wasn't my decision that was mm -hmm. she told me where she needed to go and i i went with that and th that to me is the most important part of being an author is honoring the story of the character and whether that makes them like terenia is likable but she's an awful character like i don't expect anyone to be like i want them to love her Mm -hmm. without necessarily saying yeah I, I think all her decisions were the right choices yeah and I think that we, every... don't, we don't always make the right choices as people no no exactly and I think those are the juicier characters I think those are the characters that we remember that we discuss you know because I think if there is just one one facet to them then they're just boring you know yeah. and like if they always do the right thing or always do the wrong thing then it's it's no longer interesting because it's it's almost predictable so um I think Terenia is a fantastic character I think she's just so well-rounded and delightfully wicked and but like has she has so much I don't want to say heart because she's very like she's had to be like shut off no pun intended yeah. but like um <laughs> But at the same time, she's so she's driven by her emotions so much. And mm -hmm. you know, and these emotions aren't always positive. They're not all, you know, they are greed, they are power hungry, they are, you know, through anger and envy and you know, all of these more negative feelings. But I feel like those things are so relatable, whether or not we want to admit it or not. Um yeah. yeah, I mean, you said before about um you know, like the story originally was going to be just blood cover and it was going to be like one and done novel, but now it's expanded into the series. Like how, how is blood cover and, and then the series as a result, how has that sort of developed for you? Cause I know that you've been writing blood cover for a long, long time. So yeah. Like tell me about how that all came about. Yeah. So I originally wrote blood cover totally different story 15 years ago than it is today, of course. Um, it's really grown a lot in in the characters. It used to just be like four characters. That was all that was that was in there. Um, and so when I wrote the another book in the series, which is the third book in this series, I, mm -hmm. I realized I could connect the two. I was just like, I'll just I'll just name drop, you know. 
And that story, the what's going to be the third book, it wrote itself. It was like, I couldn't stop. I pulled over driving to, to type like, okay, you got to write this right now. And it was just like on my phone. Um, that story just took me away. And the characters that imbued themselves in that story, um, Roman and Ivan, we their main characters in Ash and Heart. And because I liked writing them so much, I was like, I need more of them. And how can I bring together book three and Blood Coven? And I created this character who's related to somebody in Blood Coven who interacts with characters who are related in the third book. And so that, I remember when you first read Ash and Heart and you messaged me and you said, this feels like it was the first book you wrote in the series because it ties everything, it connects everything. Yeah. And so that's what the story was. It was connecting these worlds. You've got mm. the Luca family, you've got the Sokolov family and bringing them together. That's really what Ashenheart in the background is doing. Yeah. And then that lended itself to rewriting Blood Coven completely to give it more substance, to give it more characters, to give it more of a feminist story than it originally was and then that's where the fourth book brings them all together sort of in like an Avengers style wrap up um and it just it just kept coming back like even though it took me like over a decade to finish this series it kept returning it kept going okay we need more you need to elaborate more on these characters you need to finish their stories and so that's what I did and I almost feel like a part of me has I don't want to say died that's not the right word but concluded because the yeah. series is done like I would love to write more but there's a point where you can't yeah because then you're just sort of kicking a dead horse which mm -hmm. yeah you don't want to yeah, so no, I did write all, like, another one. novellas. Oh, you did? This is new. And yeah, so it's actually uh, Nikolai's backstory, but I've kept that one. After I wrote it, I was like, I think this is just for me. I think this is for me to know Nikolai through and through. Oh. And, and understand his beginning. Yeah. But it didn't need to be part of the series, if that makes right. sense. Yeah. Well, we'll but, wait uh, what Quill and Crow have to say on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to dig it out of the, the probably the old laptop, actually. Oh, I don't gosh. really know where it's, wow. it's hovering. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to bug you yeah. until I get to read it. <clears throat> um, <laughs> um, no, that's lush. And, and it, obviously, this has gone through like a really big journey and things. And it's and it, there was a, a release of two of the books um, previously, and they're now discontinued because there's been rewrites and redistribution since you've join Quill and Crow um and so how was how was that for you in terms of you know and, and having that change and and sort of because you were self-published previously um yeah and then sort of having that you know having that over arc of, of, of a publisher kind of thing and how was that transition yeah um well I originally self-published the first book and then another book in the series and I needed it out there and it wasn't maybe the best avenue. I think there's so many avenues for publishing that it's it's hard when you're first getting into it to kind of know what's the right. I, yeah. I didn't have connections in this publishing world. I didn't know people. I was like so green <laughs> in this world. And I, I don't talk somewhere. a lot. Yeah, exactly. I don't talk a lot about the self-published release of, of some of these books in the Bloodbound series, um, obviously because I want people to read the new versions, I want people to read Blood Coven, I want them to experience how it's changed and it's been given a home that really respects the books, it respects the series. Um, Quill and Crow have been fantastic working on this series and, and giving it the love that it needs and the space that it needs to thrive. Um, I don't talk a lot about the originally self-published versions um, because again, they're not in distribution anymore. You can't yeah. get them. I'd rather people not be like sharing that content because it's like, yeah. ah, this doesn't exist anymore. Can we yeah. just like put it to bed? It's been elevated since. And so when people are, are talking about my series, I really do hope that they're looking at these new ones, looking at Blood Coven and, and Ashen Heart coming out is, it's my favorite book in the series. And 
I'm really excited for people to, to give it a shot. And yeah. And I mean, we have to touch on the fact that it was the self-published version of Blood Coven that introduced you and I. It was, yeah. <laughs> Literally, I have so much, uh, so much gratitude towards this series. Um, because yes, yeah, as, as sort of mentioned earlier, that Sabrina and I are best friends and we live in completely opposite sides of the world. Um, you live in Canada <laughs> and I live in the UK. Um and if it wasn't for this book, we would never have, because we both were part of this Facebook book group. And you posted, hey, I've got my, my book out, please buy. <laughs> and um, <laughs> as this uh, podcast suggests, I love supporting um, indie authors, indie anything, really indie music, indie art. I, I just feel like there's so many amazing so much amazing talent out there that goes horrifically unsung so I always try and do what I can and um you know this book really appealed to my um interests um so but it, because you know self-published in Canada I couldn't really find it anywhere um unless I wanted to pay about 50 pounds worth of shipping costs which I mean for a book that I'd never heard of that I didn't know was if it was any good or not I was like mm. <laughs> so I dm'd you and I was like oh hey you know like I want to buy your book but I really don't want to have to pay 50 pounds um <laughs> and you went sort of back and forth and tried to find out where it was going to be able to you know come out and things and in that time you and I just developed this very natural friendship and you know what three and a half years later here we are and we're talking about your second novel fully published under Quill and Crow and it's fully realized and I just I feel like almost I've kind of come along on this journey with you you know oh and you have you like <laughs> yeah so this is I mean uh, you lovely. you beta read Ashenheart before I sent it to Quill and Crow like your yeah. input was was phenomenal for not just validating the story because you loved it but also giving input on where I could change. And obviously that was a success, so. Yeah, oh, well, welcome. But generally you're <laughs> welcome, anytime. Um, and then, yeah, and obviously I've read what is gonna be the third book. And uh, well, I've, I've read the the original um, before, before it's gone through a lot of edits and stuff. Um, and I'm really super excited for when that comes out as well. That was not gonna be for a little bit, so we won't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> um but uh but yeah no it's, it's been so wonderful to see this kind of like journey develop and and be along that ride with you basically yeah it's just um it's been very humbling and very um joyous I'm so proud so proud of you um anyway oh from the smushy shit let's get to sex so <laughs> as I said yes, before please yeah um as I said before you know there wasn't there's like sort of you know there's some romantic kind of things in blood coven but there's no real kind of smut whereas in here we got some smut girl how uh like what was that decision process like, like about like why have you kind of decided to put it in here is it you know yeah why why, why was that and how did that come about well, I mean, if you look at Blood Coven, like technically in a way, Blood Coven could be a, like a, a YA novel in a sense. Like yeah. it has a lot of heavy themes, but a lot of YA books do. But I think the reason it doesn't fall into YA is because I do follow adult characters as well, like Matthias mm -hmm. and Azalea, Juniper, yeah. Blaze, uh, Anna. Half the book is written in the point of view of, you know, adults, 30 yeah. to 60 year olds. And then the other half is written in the point of view of people between the ages of like 17 and 21. Um, Soren is a bit older than them, but it, um, it that's not a story that I'm going to be writing about sex. I think between a couple of characters and the other side, it could be, but the timeline being as short as it was, it doesn't mm -hmm. lend itself to believable smut. And so these characters, that's just not what was in their stories. Hmm. Um, I, I'm not going to write about teenagers having sex. Teenagers have sex. Let's face yeah. it. I'm not going to write about it. Like if they do, if it's part of the story, um, like in Ash and Heart, there is, you know, Tereni is 17 at the beginning and teenagers have sex. It's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Terenia is uh, an embodiment of what I see as like 
divine feminine, right? She is almost like a, in her own way, a bit of a goddess and yeah. she's ruthless. She's bloodthirsty. She's, she's violent. She's power hungry. And part of all that, part of being a powerful person who knows what you want and will do what you need to, to take it. Sex is part of that. Sex is something that brings so much power to you. Um, I find it's something that in a way you're connecting to somebody and they could worship you. <laughs> it, that's, I mean, that's what I, I expect nothing less than that. Um, and that's not Terenia does too. Terenia yeah. wants to be worshipped. And if she is getting sex, it is to be worshipped. It's because she knows that she is a fucking queen. <laughs> yeah. And there's there's parts in that story where there's some more casual stuff. It's, it's, I, I wouldn't say that Ashenheart is in any sense a romantic novel. No. Um, the sex mm -hmm. is not for the romance. Um, it's not, no. it's not, it's not, like it, it drives the plot. It does, uh, It's yeah. not just in there for the sake of being in there. <laughs> And Terenia being, I, I identify with her a lot in that she is pansexual. Um, mm -hmm. They wouldn't really have that term, given the fact this is like a pseudo historical novel. Pansexual is not a term. She's but open. I, yeah, like she, she's going to be with the people she wants to be with. Um, and she shows a lot of different variants of how she has sex with people, depending on who it is she's with. Yeah. And that was really fun to explore. I'm like, okay, this character, it's going to be like a little more full on and she's going to be exuding those, like the power that she has. Mm -hmm. And then there's other elements, other characters where she's a lot softer with, and it was fun to explore different sides of Terenia. Mm -hmm. And you haven't read the final book yet, but some of that lends itself into that final book. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's very annoying because um, I have asked, but it's still it's still in its last stages of editing. So there is you will no get it. To, I know. Well, I'll buy it. So, um, but yeah, it's um, no, it's it's it's. I mean, obviously, it's fun, but what it's again, it's not a romantic book. Everything is for a reason. And this isn't a book that you buy expecting loads and loads of smart. It's not like you know there are certain books that you buy because you're like, I know what I'm getting. Um, yeah. And that's not that, but it's it equally, it doesn't shy away from it either. There's no closed door scenes really. Like, you know, you are getting, because as you say, the the sex involved is either for character development or plot, plot drive. And I would say that like one of your strengths as a writer is, and I've said this a million times and I'll say it again, like you have this amazing ability, one that I envy <laughs> of being able to keep things concise. <laughs> um, and you know and um everything is for a reason there is no waste in your books but equally it doesn't feel like it's bare minimum either you get everything that you need from that scene that description those character drives the plot everything you you get everything but nothing goes to waste and I would say that exactly right like nothing is incongruous in your in your books nothing is you know, are just because, you know, there's always a reason behind everything. And I just think that that is a real um, talent and it's a natural talent, I feel. So, um, and it's really refreshing because I mean, I'm, I love a book that's, you know, waxes lyrical and it's very descriptive and things, but it is nice to mix that up. And it is nice to have books that just, they don't fuck around, you know? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I, I, you know, it's just, just furthering on your point sort of you know there is smart and sex but it's not a smart book and it is for a reason so yeah um expect with this book to have plot and to have well-rounded characters and to have certain perspectives that whether or not you agree with them they are fully developed and fully realized so yeah for sure and, and that's not to say that smart books don't have that but just don't go in expecting it to be just bam bam thank you ma'am you know <laughs> Yeah. And like, I mean, can you write about a uh, strong, powerful, sexually driven character who 
is in a blood cult if there's not a little bit of blood play? I mean, <laughs> it, give it the ha- audience it, what they want. <laughs> I write what my characters tell me to it's write. It's just you're being authentic. And Terenia said, hey, I want this. And I said, yep. yes, queen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. No, yeah, I no. will not say no. <laughs> uh-huh. Absolutely. And we all thank you for that. Thank you, Terenia, for being that mm. boss. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, what was I going to say? Um, ah, yeah. So one of the, th- I mean, there's so many different themes, um, you know, like your characters, your books are equally multifaceted when it comes to these sorts of things. Um, and obviously like one of the themes in Ashen Heart is based you know loosely but still based on like the evil queen and obviously who's the fairest of them all and you know it's all about like her need to stay young and eternally beautiful and be the most beautiful and be the best and be the most wanted and I think that like you know we live in a society where pretty privilege is is very much a thing and like you know having things based on your looks and like so much is put on that um and I I feel like this is very much a running theme it's not something that is you know smacked over the head you know it doesn't you know force it down the reader's throats or anything but it is something that is kind of like woven through this book and you know I mean there's this one line God, I'm not going to say what it is but there's this one line at the end which every time I read it it just it crushes me um, and I'll tell you what it is afterwards because I'm not sure you know what it is um, I think I know what it is maybe it is I don't know but yeah and I'm just like ah, oh, you know because I feel like our self-perception and other people's perceptions are often oh I know what it is you know what it is uh very different things and I feel like if we let ourselves be vulnerable to our flaws it would just she says with a face full of makeup um but like if we (laughs) if we let ourselves be vulnerable to our flaws and said you know what actually this this is not real or this is like I don't look like this all the time or hey I've got like this going on or this going on or you know whatever um then that that thirst to look in particular ways and things in not I mean not everyone does some people are are enlightened enough to not care so much um not this bitch clearly um so (laughs) but you know I feel like you know we we wouldn't put so much on this. So with that in mind, I was like, if you had, if, if you and Tereni were sat in a room and given Tereni's need to be beautiful and the most beautiful and, and that perception of herself, what, what would you, what would you say to her if you were given the chance? I don't think I would, I don't think we would talk. <laughs> <laughs> am I to take what I what what I think that means (laughs) um yes no um I I think I mean I've I've said it to you I've I've said how beautiful I mean I've seen I woke up next to you (laughs) I lived with you for two weeks and um (laughs) you have you've not seen me at my best you've seen me at my utter unkemptness you're always at your best but anyways what I was saying was um so obviously like there's sometimes this divide between like you have to be el natural or you have to wear makeup and like if you wear makeup you're you're tricking people blah 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 if you don't wear makeup you're sloppy or whatever and it's like it's all a balance like wear Mm. makeup if you want to wear makeup Mm. don't wear makeup if you don't want to wear makeup right like I think like the human experience is beautiful I think humans are beautiful I think that wearing makeup is beautiful I think not wearing his makeup is beautiful and Terenia is like naturally beautiful like they're they're not gonna have the same kind of makeup she doesn't really wear makeup so like she is a very beautiful person in my mind Um, I think she wears red lipstick occasionally because that's just like really accents her just the snow white evil queen kind of thing going yeah. on in the story so she wears and like it on like special occasions she wears yeah it and, exactly and she wants to stand out like that so i mean 
I try to write because like I don't want to perpetuate this this certain beauty of like she's tall she's slender she's whatever she's black hair blue eyes like I don't want to perpetuate like that's what I think beauty is because that's not necessarily what I think beauty is this is how she appeared to me in my head in earlier parts of the book because it does cover quite a few years of her life Mm -hmm. she is one way and there's a 10-year jump and there's a point where I, I mentioned that um, she's filled in, she's aged, she's gotten fuller in her cheeks and she's got more, she's not as skinny as she was as a teenager. She's got more curves and stuff. And I really want to accent that, you know, that's beautiful. And mm. even in the final book, I mentioned some changes that happened to her in that book and, mm. and, how she starts to love different parts of herself that oftentimes we can be critical of. And so it's not just this perfect picturesque beauty that she wants. It's different beauties at different times because she does mature. She does change. She does change things up in her life and and can recognize that sometimes our experience that changes our body is what makes us beautiful. And Mm -hmm even though she's super narcissistic and she's super jaded and like envious of people and wants this, like she wants to be beautiful and young forever. So she's mm-hmm. got sort of Elizabeth Bathory sort of um, influence. Yeah. I don't want to perpetuate that that's what beauty is. And, and Terenia is not, a, again, she's not a character I want you to root for, but I want you to like her even though she's awful. And so <laughs> her beliefs aren't what I'm trying to push if that makes yeah. sense yeah some of them but, yes you know she she wants women to to rise up but she'll still tear women down yeah so yeah. I don't I don't want people to like put her up on a pedestal no but I think but I want them to be stories. invested in her yes and I think that's definitely the way that it comes across you know to me as well and I think you know there's lots of different types of women described in this book and all of them are beautiful in their own right you know you've got like broader women you've got slimmer we've got blonde you've got redheads you've got you know lots of different types of women um different ages different ways of life um you know and they all make an impression somehow you know um and I think that that's really positive and um yeah it's 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 definitely good to see and um yeah I'm very intrigued because I haven't I haven't read the last book so I'm very intrigued to see how her journey concludes and and this growth of which you speak um (laughs) (laughs) but yeah I mean like you know as you said though she's a um she is a sort of a force to be reckoned with and she isn't to be put on a pedestal she's not um there are some really heinous things that she does um and some of it we can understand from her perspective some of it not not I mean in my opinion not so much but um (laughs) um I was uh yeah I was just going to ask like can you tell us about um I mean not necessarily to do with Terenio it could be any any part of it but is there um because there's a lot of brutality and I mean we're, we're dealing with a blood cult and there's vampires and there's you know all of this so um yeah can you can you sort of divulge a little bit about some of the more brutal scenes for our like horror fans yeah so I touch on some brutal scenes in Blood Coven um obviously there's a wolf that slaughters families like there's implications Mm -hmm. there that you know theoretically he's killed people of all ages because he was forced to yeah um I lean in a lot to gore and you know violence and backstabbing and just ruthlessness like one of one of the lines that really carries ashen heart is to be ruthless and mm-hmm. it's said a couple of times in the story that Terenia wants to be ruthless um there's a character who wants her to be ruthless and mm-hmm. And that's really what it's all about is like this pressure of like, you can't get anywhere unless you are ruthless. And it is a story about how 
power corrupts us and changes yeah. us. And I mean, the, the whole the whole series of, of the Bloodbound series is about power corrupting. Um, you see it with with Azalea, you see it with uh, Red, you see it with so many characters in Blood Coven. Um, and it doesn't mean it corrupts everyone because there's some characters with power who, who don't use it in a negative way. You look at, you know, Alina, she's got power mm. and she doesn't, she doesn't want to do harm to people. Um, and so with, with Ashenheart and with Terenia and, and you know, the, the people she's surrounded with, Roman and Ivan, ruthlessness is seen as what's going to get you ahead. And if you are not willing to make the most ruthless decision, you're not good enough. You are not strong enough. Yeah. And that's, that's something that causes a divide between the brotherhood right? Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of a key element in a couple of these stories yeah. is a char characters who aren't ruthless, they're not going to cut it. And and how does that impact them? And what kind of breaks does that cause between the mm. dynamics between, between family and found family? I guess you can call it found family. Um, yeah, I'd say so. Dysfunctional, but... Dysfunctional, <laughs> but, you know... <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I I think that that all of all of that is a hundred percent correct. Um, so, yeah. So like the what you're saying with the brutality of it and things is that like again, it's all it's not incongruous. It's not you know just for the sake of it. It's all to do with how these things sort of develop. Um, yeah, and how the characters go. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> and then what was I going to ask? Oh yeah, so obviously we've touched on fairy tales, we've touched on like more like horror aspects and things. What are some of the, some of your like fairy tale, favorite fairy tales and like horror inspirations and has any kind of, obviously you've mentioned um, Elizabeth, uh, ba Elizabeth Bathory. Bathory, thank you. Um, and um, you know, a few other things. Is there anything else that has influenced your work or just that you just personally love as like a horror fan? Yeah, um, so I definitely, I, I, I will say I wrote Ashen Heart prior to seeing the film Byzantium. There is a lot of connections. Yeah. Um, Byzantium is a, a vampire film that's a, a dual timelines. It's like the before and after of these characters. And there's, there's one thing about that book or that, that movie, and it's about the vampires take away they say women can't be vampires women aren't permitted to to what they say is give life mm. in that they, you're not allowed to make another vampire a you're not allowed to make another vampire and i'm yeah. like you are taking away this part that like you know like a it's I, intrinsic I, a, to being a, a woman for the for a lot of the time like to for a cisgendered woman oh, yeah your ability to give life like that's a huge thing in in throughout history is like that was like something that we could do mm -hmm. right or had to do depending um and to have that stripped away to say like oh you're not allowed to do this and just it wasn't it's giving life in the sense of like turning somebody into a vampire but taking that away from this character i found that fascinating and that's not nothing to do with with ashen heart at all yeah. but just this idea of a, a patriarchy a hierarchy a brotherhood and then thinking they know what is best and it crumbling yeah no and definitely yeah 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 so there's some uh, draw between that yeah no definitely and I think as well just having any choice as a woman that we're given removed you know because say throughout history we've had so little choice in anything that we do um whether it's having children whether it's you know being married whether it's having money whether it's voting whether it's you know literally women had no choice on anything for the longest time and you know we're still fighting these a lot of these rights today um when it comes to things like trans women and it comes to um you know even like in, in other countries and cultures and things there's there's still so much work to be done so I feel like even though we don't face the same um, hardships hardships yeah <clears throat> that Terenia does and the people in her life do there's still a relatability there 
and um, the and her ideas are very progressive. Um, and that's again, that's something that is um, true of all your books. They're very progressive in terms of the messages that they send out. Um, and you know, and I feel like, yeah, there is something there is something here that like I'm not saying that just women can relate, but that women in particular will be able to relate to um, and having that choice. I mean, even just the, you know, the life that Terenia is so desperately trying to avoid of being married off and having children and all of this kind of thing. And then when she actively tries to avoid those things and leave the people who would see her li live that life, um, among other reasons, she mm -hmm. ends up still in a very patriarchal society, even though it's supposed to give her freedom and power. It's she's still mm -hmm. being minded by men in charge. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting um, aspect to the story. And it's again, it's 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 very much there, but it's not beating you over the head with it. And it's just something that happens very organically and naturally. Um, because of the characters and because of the situations and time that they're in. So yeah, no, fair play, absolutely. Um, so I was going to ask you some little questions, just like nothing too deep. Um, yeah. One of them, so without going into like spoilers too, too much, um, can you, I'll let you say it so that I don't blur anything um a bit more than I should um so can you explain about a little a little bit about Roman's offer so Roman is this I don't want to say anything I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take it away <laughs> yeah so Roman is a very daunting character um he was a lot of fun to write I I really enjoyed getting into his like I don't write in his point of view but we get to know a lot about Roman in this in this book mm. and he's very calculated he's very cold he's very he knows what he's doing um but he's quite reserved in the same way um or at the same time I suppose so the offer that he extends to Terenia is basically saying I can I can give you everything you want and what she wants is power and and beauty right mm -hmm. and he says that he can give it to her so if roman came up to me and offered me the things that i want most in this world i mean we've all been cautioned of you know if the devil were to offer you something there's always a catch right yeah but if it was roman with his charisma and <laughs> I feel like I I probably would, depending on the state I was in. So obviously, <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> obviously, if you're at a good place in your life, you don't necessarily need to take that offer. Like if mm -hmm. you're comfortable with the things you have, you might not have everything. But if he were to come offer it to me right now, I'd be like, no, actually, I'm good. I have mm -hmm. everything I need. My emotional needs are met. My, mm -hmm. my cups are full. Yeah. If I was in this Terenius situation, mm -hmm. what is she risk? What is she losing? Yeah. If no. you have nothing to lose and somebody says, hey, I can, and, and maybe I'm saying that, like, maybe I am vulnerable of being part of a cult. I don't know. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but the like, devil takes what, many guises. <laughs> exactly. But they prey on people who don't have. That's who, exactly right. Are isolated. Yeah. No, and I won't speak too much more about his offer and how that works or doesn't work for her. Um, but if I was in her shoes, yes, I think I would. Yeah, I think I would even if I wasn't in her shoes. I'm really impulsive. So also like <laughs> blue eyes as well. Got, he's got he's a all... thing about him. Uh, he does have a, you know, he has a thing about him. Yeah, mm -hmm. like yeah, I, I won't I won't go into too much to spoil anything, but like. You're not going to get a whole lot out of Roman, but like, I think I would still be like, yes, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I concur. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So if you had to cook a meal for one of your characters, who would it be and what would you cook? And you can't say blood because that's a cop out. Okay, but they're vampires. To, I know, but if you were going to actually have to cook them a meal, what would you cook them? 
Mm. And it doesn't have so, to be, it could be anybody. It could be any one of your characters. So, well, um, you know what Hannibal Lecter eats <laughs> Ray Liotta's brain. No, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I yeah. feel like the best way to impress any of those characters mm-hmm. is to grab to grab someone who's pursuing them or you know pissing them off because yeah. that's all it really takes for Roman. Yeah. Um and. And serve their brain on a platter. Yeah. All right. Very yeah. good. I feel like if I were to take them out to dinner, yeah, I would go to that restaurant from the menu with Ray Fine. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I'd be like, like, y'all are fucked up enough to, to enjoy this. <laughs> yeah, and also Sit they, don't back. Need to, they don't need to eat much, so those tiny weeny portions are they're fine. Um, yeah. yeah. Me, however, no thanks. I need something actually filling. Um, but, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I was. It's funny you mentioned Hannibal because, like, my idea would be something like that Hannibal would make, you know, like in the TV show. Ooh, yeah. um, you know, if anyone who's seen that, like, the kind of dishes that he presents are just like masterful and they're so decadent. And, you know, there's things that are like illegal and unethical and stuff. So I think I'd probably serve something like that. Yeah, I think they would appreciate the shit out of that. I feel like for Ivan, I could give him like, a black oh. coffee and he'd be like yeah. i'm gonna bow down to you <laughs> yeah give him a black coffee and like a, a rare steak boom yeah Done. yeah like yeah all right. like yeah like he i feel like is a man of um very simple taste like he's a very straightforward oh you know what i would feed ivan oh yeah <laughs> okay mm-hmm. come on then this is why we're friends this is why we're Me. friends <laughs> You would be the dish and he would be the table. Mm-hmm. 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 It's okay. It's fine. I've clicked. Uh, there's this is not there's no character that I have ever written who has got me, like, smitten. Other than really? a, a raging psychopath. <laughs> what is it about the raging psychopath that just gets us all gooey? I don't understand. Oh, oh is that it. a red flag? I'll, I'll take oh. two. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> if you. Yeah, let's not drive by that one. Let's just stop and just, yeah, pick that one up. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. oh, green? No, I don't really like green. Boring. Green is not my color. Thank you. Bright red, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Says so the girl who has an entire room painted green. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah. I don't, but I do quite like green. I do quite like green. Yeah. But like that dark green. So like green flags, maybe, but with like an edge. An edge. A sharp edge. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, cool. So uh, d- coming to the end now, um, if you could describe selling point, if you could describe Ash and Hart in three words, it's a basic question, but I feel like it's a good way to sort of sign off. How would you describe it in three words? Um, I know that I should have prepared for this question. Yeah, it's not like you didn't ask me this question and I gave you a whole list of words yesterday, but you know, it's fine. Just like um, play the like the Jeopardy music. Um, I don't know what that sounds like. Uh, I don't either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have cable. No. I I would say um, ruthless. Hmm. Uh, unforgiving. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Unforgiving slash unapologetic. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, can I say spicy? Yeah. Okay, we're going to go with spicy. Because right now it's the, it's the only novel I have that has like actual proper spice throughout. Um, yeah. And I think that's why it's my favorite book. And <laughs> it's why I think that it's your favorite book in the series. No. And hopefully everyone else who reads it, hopefully it's your favorite book in the series. Yeah. But in saying that, though, as I said, I've read three of them, and that's not to say that they drop off after this. This just this one is the, uh, yeah, it's 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 unrelenting. I'd say. That's my, I think the series, point. I think the series has like a little bit for everyone. Like, yeah, Blood Coven's a little more soft while still pushing like the witchcraft and the feminism. Um, the third book is, I would say, the thir- third book is the most wholesome. Yeah. I can see that, but there's definite, I mean, there are 
there are moments though where I'm like Oh, yeah. yeah, there's there some are, body horror. There's some real, yeah. I mean, I'm a horror fan. I read a lot of horror books. You know, I read, I watch horror films. I have two horror movie podcasts, and I, um, yeah, and I'm, I remember reading that book, being like, oh no, 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 you know, like it's, oh, it's I had fun with that one. Yeah, I bet. I mean, it's wholesome, but Jesus, like it definitely, it's it's not the Brady it's, Bunch. You know? Because I, when I, when I get a good character, when I get like a wholesome male character, they're my favorite. I love to break them. Yeah, I do. really, really love to just, I'm kind of like Terenia that way. I'm like, oh, I'm going to crush you. Yeah. And I'm yeah, going to have fun doing it. <laughs> yeah no no no, definitely um it's quite funny because um when I reread Ashen Heart for for this um and I've got like because the first time I read it was nearly two years ago and Mm -hmm. you know our our friendship and everything has developed over the last two years as it would as any friendship would um and like obviously I know you so much more and you know all of this and (laughs) I definitely see you in (laughs) Terenia like (laughs) especially lately I feel like when we first met I was much more I was much more uh almost Alina-esque a bit more a bit more quiet um I would say in the last few months I have really been channeling my inner Terenia you're in your villain era and we love that so (laughs) yeah yeah same, we do. same um same always same you and I <laughs> um all right awesome so um yeah that's uh that that is the interview concluded um Blood Coven is available to buy online currently that is through Pull and Crow Publishing House Amazon and recently has been uploaded to Audible so you can catch that however you read um and Ashen Heart is uh, due for release on the 15th of March this year and that is also available um through Quill and Crow on pre-order currently so I encourage you to go out and put that through um there will be links in the comments um you know and all over my social media and stuff um and yeah so and then obviously once it's released it will be on Amazon and such as well but I had a quick look today and it's not available currently for pre-order on Amazon or anything um but it is there if you want to bookmark it or anything like I've I thoroughly suggest that you do because you don't want to miss out on this book it's absolutely wonderful and you don't have to check out Blood Coven to enjoy this one but just for your own reading goodness I would suggest you also check out Blood Coven as well because it is a fantastic book both of them um and I'm so excited to get my proper copy of Ashen <laughs> Heart in my hands <laughs> uh so yeah so uh yeah so that, uh, you've been uh, watching or listening to Kate Anjou's book reviews um you can catch me on TikTok and Instagram on kate.anjou that is a-n-j-o-u kate.anjou.book.reviews or you can check me out on Facebook under Kate Anjou's book reviews um, or you can pop me an email at um, Kate Anjou's book reviews at outlook.com um, but thank you very much for joining me today Sabrina thank you so much for coming on it has been an absolute delight and um, yeah and we will definitely be following your series and your career and I'm sure you'll be on again in future so thank you so much only if you'll have me always well thank you so much for having me um I had a lot of fun which is no surprise Uh, I love talking to you about books because you have such good insight I mean yesterday I asked him like how would you describe Ashenheart like give me some words and you were like boom paragraph and I was like whoa um are you (laughs) like my head (laughs) I I appreciate the marketing help (laughs) (laughs) I really do and I love talking about books with you and I just appreciate the hell out of your commentary and your love of subtext sluts for subtext that's what it was oh yeah yeah so yeah we're gonna do our own basically this show but both of us but you are so busy with your books and um and general life things um so yeah so I I ventured out on my own but I'm so glad I get to um share this with you in this way and hopefully you know maybe you can come on and maybe do some things and you know we'll see we'll see what's up but yeah we had a name with it was it sluts for subtext (laughs) 
because we all thank you for coming to my tip talk (laughs) (laughs) if I ever do a Patreon Um, that's what it's called (laughs) hell yeah you'll get people rolling in (laughs) oh and here's me thinking here's something I'd have to sell myself but we move (laughs) we are sex positive here we are sex positive sex workers work so you know yeah you got to flaunt it right that is it from me i think that is it from you so thanks very much and we'll catch you later thank you